sure to check out the Studios America podcast. You'll get the State of the Race bonus episodes for free. We did one on Friday previewing South Carolina for you. We'll probably do another one coming up, I don't know, maybe this week. I, I don't know. We'll get into the, the whole primary thing and whether there actually is a primary here in a little bit. Um, but we'll uh, as we get closer to November, things start heating up. We're going to be doing a lot more of these, and you're going to want to be able to get them. Just little bite-sized, 10-minute type chunks that will walk you through everything you need to know about the election. Uh, I think you'll like it. State of the Race is on the Stu Does America feed, audio-only podcast. Make sure to do that. Also, we're dropping new comedy skits on our YouTube page. We just started doing this over a few weeks ago, and uh, you're going to like it, I think. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if I should guarantee that, but it's YouTube.com slash Stu Does America. Uh, today, we dropped um, a look uh, with a couple of sportscasters looking at a battle between Israel and Hamas. And I... I <laughs> I don't want to give you any more than that because, uh, I mean, we're on YouTube for the moment, I think, but we probably will be kicked off by the end of the day. Tim Barton joins us with some facts about the Founding Fathers that you probably have not heard before. South Carolina, of course, had its primary election. We'll go over the results there, but we're going to start with by doing Fonny's phone records. I love the Fonny story. I am totally, in, like, I am in on the Fonny soap opera. I want more of it. I want more testimony from Fonny. I want it all and I want more moments like, you know, I want more moments like this when she went to the church and she just told you that all they were doing was persecuting a black woman just for being black. That's all that's going on here. Uh, let me give you a little rewind and re remind you uh, her justification for all of this before we got the facts. We are at a time in history when you can no longer sit back and just let other folks do it. You cannot expect black women to be perfect and save the world. The Lord is completing us. We are not perfect. You didn't say you we didn't. need your prayers. We need to be allowed to stumble. We need grace. With that kind of support, we will move mountains and do Jesus' will. Stumbling all the way. All right, so basically, you, you don't... I mean, I don't know who was saying that black women needed to be perfect. Um, I mean, ideally, not sleeping with another black woman's husband is part, you know, be ideal. But that's just, I don't know that anyone was asking any black person to be perfect or any person to be perfect, actually. Um, you know, really, no one expects perfection out of people. Um, though we do expect, once you have realized you've done something wrong, to either deal with the consequences of that or at least, uh, you know, hope, uh, pray for forgiveness. Um, I, I don't know if that's what she was doing there. Certainly didn't sound like it. I'm also a little concerned about uh, her speaking about politics uh, from the pulpit. Sounds a little Christian nationalist to me. And I'm a tad concerned about that. Um, let me also give you uh, a little bit of uh, a rewind, a reminder of the uh, Fani on trial extravaganza we saw from a couple of weeks ago. First, uh, her railing on politics and uh, going after her accusers for what they were doing. Watch. Well, no, no, no. Look. I object to you getting records. You've been intrusive into people's personal lives. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. So my question was, do you have mm -hmm. any I object to getting any personal records of mine? We're not dealing with privilege through a witness. And I'm not, no, 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 I'm not dealing with privilege. What um, we had offered to put them in camera for the court to review. And I just want to know if she has any That's problem. That's something to deal with with a witness. She is not under, on trial, and she's correct. She's not on trial uh, for uh, trying to up, upend the election in 2020. She is only on trial for wearing her dress backwards. We don't know if she did it or not. A lot of people, experts, uh, believe that she did. And I want to know what happened there because, you know, some, I, I don't know. I don't put on dresses, so I don't know. Maybe they're really, maybe a lot of people wear them backwards all the time. I've never noticed it before, but I am fascinated to know the answer to that. Also, if you remember her incredibly unbelievable explanation as to why uh, this money uh, that, that she claims to have paid back, there's no record of it. Now, of course, her explanation was something about reimbursing him in cash. Watch. Um. You said in the affidavit that you roughly shared travel, though, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this roughly sharing travel, you're saying she reimbursed you? She did. And where did you deposit the money she reimbursed you? Oh, it was cash. She didn't, she didn't give me any checks. So crazy. she paid you cash for her share of all these vacations? Mr. Schaefer, you'll step out if you do that again. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so all of the vacations that she took, she paid you cash for? Yes, ma'am. 
and you purchased all of these vacations on your business credit card, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you included those in deductions on your taxes, correct? No, ma'am. Hmm. Now, uh, of course, Fani went on to echo that exact same sentiment. This was the story they had kind of lined up beforehand, that they were dating, they went on vacations together, she had tens of thousands of dollars in her home, she would take uh, four or $5,000 out of her stash of cash that was in her home and hand it to him, and then he would never deposit. That is legitimately what they said happened. Now, as we all know, being human beings, this interaction between a couple has never occurred in the history of human beings. No one has ever done this. I mean, maybe if you're in the mob, this, something like this would happen. I don't know. Uh, but she's got tons and tons of cash, and she's doing that all the time. By the way, she also wanted you to know that someone accusing her of, of having Nathan Wade spend the night at her condo was lying. Watch. Did Mr. Wade visit you at the place you laid your head? When? Has he ever visited you at the place you laid your head? So let's be clear, because you've lied in this. this. Let me tell you which one you lied in. Right here. I think you lied right here. No, 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 no. no. This is the truth, Judge. And this it, is, it, it is a lie. It is a lie. You Mr. Sena, thank you. We're going to take five minutes. So this is their defense. You know, she tried to shake up the trial at that moment because she knew she was being pressed in a direction she didn't want to be pressed in. And so their, their justification, their direction here for a defense in this situation is to just straight up lie and just hope that people don't realize what's going on because there have been documents now released, phone records released, and what they're hoping is, you know, 90% of people are never going to look at these. They're never going to know what's, what's there. But you will not be in that 90%. You are the 10%, the elite 10% who actually know things about things. And so we're going to go through this here and show you how embarrassing their case is. Now, Look, we all know why this is important. Uh, we've talked about that in previous shows. Go back and watch if you'd like. But the fact is that once you say you never dated this person before you hired him, and once you say uh, that uh, this relationship did not exist, you've now made a statement to the court. Not just made a statement, not, not tweeted out on social media. You've made an official statement to the court and then testified. Both of them have testified on this uh, behalf even though it was very surprising because there was another expert witness or a, a witness, I guess, who came in and said, actually, they were dating in like 2019, so they're totally lying. Now, we didn't know if that was true. Maybe this person has a, an ax to grind, right? We don't know. Well, the expert witness was brought in and Trump lawyers have that information. Cell phone data raises questions about the start of Willis-Wade relationship. I would not phrase that the same way the Atlanta Journal-Constitution phrased it. I don't think it raised questions. I think it answered them. Uh, but let's go through some of it. Now, remember, um, Wade had said that they were together at times in this area. Um, Wade said he could have been in the Hatfield area for any number of reasons. He said he could have been visiting the Porsche Experience Center, the airport, the Delta Airlines headquarters, or local restaurants. Now, remember that, because he could have been at the Porsche Experience Center. So perhaps when he was at the Porsche Experience Center, the cell phone data uh, would maybe prove or show that, and at this point they didn't know that they had the cell phone data, but that's coming up. Uh, Wade testified, by the way, he had not been over there more than 10 times. They both testified to that same fact. But there's a moment in the trial that was really important. And it's the type of thing that if you happen to be a person who's being asked questions, you're sitting up there, Next to the judge, you're sitting back, you think everything's going your way, and you get a question like this. I want you, because I love you, I, I love you, and I want the best for you. So if you are ever in this situation, I want you to realize what's going on here, okay? Because this is important. And I, I thought it was obvious, probably is obvious to you, but it was not obvious to either Fonnie Willis or Nathan Wade. If someone asks you the following question, there's a very specific response you need to have when it is asked, Okay. Here it is. If phone records were to reflect that you were making phone calls from the same location as the condo before November 1st of 2021, and it was on multiple occasions, would those phone records be wrong? The uh, uh, lawyer asked Wade. Uh, if the phone records reflected that, he said, yes, sir. Uh, and Wade responded, they'd be wrong. The lawyer asked, they'd be wrong, Wade responded. Now, the reason I bring this up for you and your purposes is if you're on the stand 
And someone says, if phone records were to show that you're a total liar, would those phone records be lying? What that means is they have the phone records. So the little ruse you've tried, you've aligned with Fonnie Willis, allegedly. Uh, you've aligned with Fonnie Willis and you said, oh, let's get our story straight. Let's all say it didn't happen until then. That little story falls apart when the phone records come in. And of course, as you know, as any idiot would know after that question came to them, the phone records have now come in. We uh, have an affidavit here from an expert witness. And this is not just phone records, so we can all look at them themselves. It's an expert witness looking at these phone records and analyzing them. And he goes through exactly how he's analyzing them. And this is what he said. Cell Hawk is considered by law enforcement to be the gold standard in cell phone records analytics. It is used throughout the United States and Georgia by law enforcement agencies and should be well known to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. A cornerstone of the Cell Hawk analytics data is the inability to manipulate the data. So we have reliable data who's been, uh, that has been analyzed by a reliable expert that has been utilized many, many times in cases that utilize uh, phone records, and they're using CellHawk technology, which is used all the time. Um, so this technology is very reliable, and it is kind of hard to actually manipulate. And of course, you can be, you can give very, like they were in Atlanta, or you can be very, very specific with what area they were in. Exhibit A, isolating all interactions. This includes voice calls and text messages between Mr. Wade and Mr. Will, uh, Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis during the period of available records in 2021. The report revealed over 2,000 voice calls and just under 12,000 text messages exchanged over the 11-month period in 2021. Now, Let's start with the text messages. 12,000 text messages between two people, really, really a high number. I don't want to hear from anybody that often. This is in a 10-month period. Uh, I don't want to hear from anybody that often. But let's try to give them the benefit of the doubt here, right? Text message interactions, what does that mean exactly? I mean, maybe it was, uh, you know, certainly you think of messages back and forth, but maybe you give a thumbs-up emoji and that counts as one. Maybe there's a, you know, a... An exclamation point after a news story, I don't know, could be something that's really, really meaningless. 12,000, could it add up? I mean, it still seems really high. Maybe they're counting group texts that they're on together. I don't know. That number still seems abnormally high. I mean, I certainly have not texted my, my wife in, uh, in 10 months 12,000 times. I mean, it's just absurdly high. But okay, maybe. But can you imagine, can you imagine fielding 2,000 phone calls in 10 months from anybody? Who's the person you'd like to talk to the absolute most? Who's that person? Do you want to hear from them 2,000 times in 10 months? And especially if that person had to be Fonnie Willis, you'd be suicidal after getting 2,000 calls from this woman in, in 10 months. It's, it's incredible. Obviously, there's almost no possible way. Again, this is before they're working together. So there's not even a work relationship yet. There's just a friendship relationship, as they say, but not romantic. I mean, look, allegedly BS is what I will say about that. Now, going farther, focusing on geolocation activity near Fani's condo, I constructed a very conservative geofence, which isolates the two cell towers in closest proximity to this address. The purpose of this geofence was to conduct an initial assessment of whether Ms. or Mr. Wade's and phone ever connected to these towers near Ms. Wade's condo. Additionally, this modality was used to eliminate the possibility that hits could be associated with routine travel on either I-75 or I-85 or to nearby visits to nearby attractions or the airport. So go back and think about their excuse. Their excuse was, oh, I was at the Porsche Experience Center. Well, they, they used the geofence that eliminated that. Okay? They eliminated the airport. They eliminated the, uh, the roads passing by. And they looked for very specific data. Let's go farther. The, this conservative analysis revealed a minimum of 35 occasions when Mr. Wade's phone connected for an extended period to either one of these two towers. The data reveals he is, is stationary and not in transit. So, again, he's not just driving by. Remember what he said. He said he was only there 10 times, not 35. And he said he's, he could be there for, I don't know, uh, different attractions. Now, after these results came out, they're still doubling down on these stories, which is incredible to me. I, it is 
malpractice that they are still trying this. But I want to give you what, what they said today before we get into the, the results of these specific inquiries. They said the records do nothing more than demonstrate that special prosecutors Wade's telephone was located somewhere within a densely populated multiple mile radius where various residents, res, uh, restaurants, bars, nightclubs and other businesses are located. Willis's motion said now let's break this down quickly piece by piece. They do nothing more than demonstrate that sp- special prosecutors Wade's telephone was located. So they're trying to say, what if it was just his phone? Not him, but just his phone. Like he, someone else took his phone and brought it there. What about that? Will you believe that? They're attempting that. Then they say, well, it could be residences, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, and other businesses. Well, uh, let me give you some more specific details that might shed some light on what what restaurant they may have been at. Uh, I was directed to conduct a deeper analysis on two specific dates, September 11th, 2021, before I understand Mr. Wade was hired, and November 29th through 30th, 2021, prior to what I understand was the in-court testimony that the romantic relationship began in 2022. Specifically, on September 11th, 2021, Mr. Wade's phone arrived at the geofence location uh, on the at the uh, condo uh, where Fonnie uh, Willis lives. The phone remained there until 3.28 a.m., at which time the phone traveled directly to his residence. The phone arrived at approximately 4.05 a.m. And all that you might say, okay, well, I mean, it kind of locks out the Porsche Experience Center because I don't think that's open at 3.28 a.m. But maybe a bar, maybe, I don't know what the alcohol laws are in Georgia, but maybe bars are open past two. I don't know. May, may, the airport certainly would be open, though we talked about how the technology already geofenced off the airport, so that doesn't really work. But this part really kind of gives you a problem. She, he leaves at 4.05 a.m. and records demonstrate he sends a text to Miss Willis at 4.20 a.m. This is, of course, known as the I got home okay, honey text. Okay. We all know how this works, and uh, this is what you call a booty call, okay? Allegedly, an alleged booty call. Of course, this is not the only one. Additionally, on November 29th, 2021, Mr. Wade's phone was pinging on the East Cobb Towers near his residence, and following a call from Ms. Willis, so she calls him at 1132, he then drives, just coincidentally, to the exact area where she is, where her condo is, Stays at that place in her right around her residence uh, until after midnight. And then uh, at 1243 a.m. arrives. The phone remains there till 455 a.m. You tell me. We're all adults here. What do you think's going on? You got a you get a call from a woman at 1132. You drive over there. You arrive at 1243. You stay there till 455 a.m. What do you think is going on there? Do you think anybody knows? Well, they're trying their best to to make it seem like, well, it could have been anything. They are legitimately sticking to this, even with all this information. And again, this is only two incidents. We know there's more. Former DeKalb County District Attorney Robert James said the cell phone data raises questions, does it? People could look at this and be suspicious, but in the court of law, you need proof. The real question is whether there was proof there was romantic relationship at that time. And I don't think that proves there was. It just proves there was a relationship where they've already acknowledged. Of course, they acknowledged a totally different relationship, a totally different amount of times they had that relationship. And of course, none, never disclosed. In fact, they denied that he spent the night, which he blatantly did. Not to mention that if they have these text records, Right now, they have the metadata. Eventually, they're going to get the transcripts of these texts. And if you tell me these people who were this, uh, th- were disregarding their uh, secrecy this much, didn't have stuff in the text messages that would indicate they were having a relationship, I am highly skeptical. They're just trying to do everything they can to get themselves out of trouble. And they don't care if they discredit Cellhawk technology, which has probably put dozens of murderers behind walls in her own district. Uh, They don't care if they discredit that technology to get themselves out of trouble. It's amazing. And look, you can go back to the beginning of this, and I hear this from uh, my friends on the left a little bit. Well, what does this have to do with anything? Why does it matter if they had an affair? So what? She could just say, look, he's the best guy for the job, and so what we had an affair doesn't really matter. And that may have been a valid argument at the very beginning, or at least one that I think a lot of people would entertain. A lot of people are forgiving about personal behavior. They don't really care. But when you lie to the court about that behavior blatantly, 
over and over and over again, you're putting yourself in real trouble. And this is not only a Donald Trump story now. This isn't a story that might, this, this case might get tossed out, because that's very possible. I would argue this very well may lead to her disbarment. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, you can certainly make the case that she's committed perjury. They both committed perjury, and that follows a one to ten year prison sentence. I don't think you're going to see anything like that. But her losing her law license may very well occur here. And at the very least, they may have to assign this case to somebody else. You're not supposed to lie to the court like that. She did it, allegedly, and now the data is proving it. And this is turning from just an embarrassing situation to an absolute catastrophe for Democrats. Do you remember a time, think of the olden days, when vital medications didn't get rationed in the United States? I mean, I remember that time. It used to be something that would happen in other countries, but not in America. Unfortunately, things aren't that way anymore, and this is one reason you need to have the Jace case on hand. It is a personalized emergency medication kit that contains five essential antibiotics, which treat the most common, common and deadly bacterial infections. It is customizable. Uh, they've got dozens of add-on medications available. You can choose the ones that best fit you and your family's needs, and you can get gift cards for your family or loved ones so they can get customized Jace cases of their own. Jace is simple. They make this super easy. Just go online, fill out a form, and then when you get a, your prescription, life-saving medication sent right to your door, you just move on with peace of mind. And you're not just hoping to have access to the medication you need in an emergency. Go to jacemedical.com, enter the code STU at checkout. Get a discount on your order now. The promo code is STU at jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E medical.com. It's jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E medical.com. I'm happy to welcome Tim Barton to the program. He's the president of Wall Builders and author of the new book, The American Story, Building the Republic which is available now wherever you get your books. Tim, how's it going? Good, Stu. How are you? Congratulations. The book is out. It Thank came you. out on President's Day, which is fitting. Uh, yes. Fitting. Um, in, in a context where we were seeing a list of the new, uh, <laughs> the top presidents of all time, and uh, I was surprised to see Barack Obama seventh and FDR in the top three, and Donald Trump, of course, was last. That, that of course, is going to be expected. <laughs> but Woodrow Wilson's, like, a top 15, better than Reagan. I mean, this is a world that uh, I think needs a true history telling of our country. It really does give confirmation of why this book is important. <laughs> yes. um, you know, who should have been in the top five best and top five worst? Ours would have been a bit different, just <laughs> basing it on history, right? Yeah. I, people have their different metrics, and if, you know, we just would have based it on history and productivity and facts, Yeah. Um, which is different. Yeah, uh, that's a different approach definitely than they took. It's funny because as we were talking about that list a little bit, we were kind of toying with our own lists, and, and you realize that, you know some of the names, of course, you know these names, you know maybe a thing or two about them, but you don't know a lot of their stories, how they got to these positions, maybe some of the big ones you do. Mm. But you guys started right at the beginning, and you're yeah. going through what is the first seven presidents. The first right? seven. Yeah. And, and the reason was because all seven of them were actually part of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. All of them actually fought, took part of the revolution, so all of them understood the birth of the nation to some extent. I mean, Andrew Jackson was 13 years old when he's first part, and so he was too young to be a soldier, but he's a spy and he is captured. He's a prisoner of war. Uh, when he, he, in, in the midst of this, and he might have been 14 at this time, he had a British officer uh, take a sword and he told Andrew Jackson to shine his boots and Andrew Jackson you know, told him where he could stick it kind mm -hmm. of scenario. Mm -hmm. And he drew a sword and slashed down. Jackson put up his hand, it cut his hand, but cut across his face. And he carried the scar the rest of his life. All that to say is, is they all paid a price in the revolution. They all went through things. And so when you get to the Constitution, we become a nation, they, they all understood to some extent what America was about. And, and kind of to your point, when we look at a list even of, of presidents, the really good ones, the bad ones, however we're going to rank it, people intuitively have a feeling. And maybe it's a different feeling if you're Democrat, Republican, white. You know, maybe a Democrat putting that list together puts Obama as number seven instead of probably yeah. where he deserves to be <laughs> yes. historically. We often have a feeling about them, but especially as we go through these first seven presidents, we do so much talking with people about American history, and most people know the names Washington or Adams, Jefferson, Madison, but most people couldn't tell you anything really in, instinctively, intuitively deep about them, and, and most people don't even know Monroe or John Quincy Adams or 
Andrew Jackson, some Southerners write Andrew Jackson, War of 1812, but really we don't know much about them. So what we wanted to do is go kind of reintroduce Americans to names they might've heard of, but stories they don't know. And what's so brilliant about what the founding fathers did is they, their lives not only serve as examples of things that are positive, negative, what to do, not to do, but they gave some incredible advice of what would help America be successful. And so you have even the psychotomy of number one, George Washington, and then the seventh president, uh, Andrew Jackson. Washington gives us brilliant advice. And Jackson's like, we're doing none of that. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> yeah. He's tipping over the canoe. <laughs> right. And, and modern politics really has been more shaped by the influence of Andrew Jackson and George Washington and not for the better. But we go through that and then try to give some hope and encouragement of if, if we would return to the advice of Washington, right? We might can, can redirect the ship a little bit. I don't know that, you know, we're going to stop everything that's been going on. But if, if we don't know what the example is or what the goal is, we're never going to reach the objective. And so yeah. that's what we want to bring people back to. And we don't know. I mean, we've, we're totally lost, right, in this world. Yeah. Like, we seriously, I mean, I, I was, it made me think of you guys uh, last week when I was watching the clip of the lady on MSNBC yes. where she was like, yeah, can you believe these Christian nationalists think that your, your rights come from God? And I'm like, every, every founder, it's like they wrote this down, they said it, they put, they pretty much carved it in stone. Right. Like this was the most important thing they discussed over and over and over again about your rights not being able to be taken away by the government. It was the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States. Yes. Like th this is what they all, they disagreed about a lot. They're like, no, we all agree with this one. Yeah. Uh, we all agree. So your argument is now that actually they probably would support this because they largely hate the founding fathers, right? So right. To, to label them as Christian nationals, they probably would like that. Yep. But by their definition, yeah. Every founding father would fit that category. And it's just, it's so humorous when you start going down this Christian nationalist perspective, there's no consistent measurement. It's, you yeah. know, they're just throwing out it's these things, slur, right? right? If you believe the constitution, you're a Christian nationalist. Huh? What, what does that even mean? Right. Right. That's crazy. But to their point, we've lost so much history that we don't recognize what was a self-evident truth to the founding fathers, right? When Jefferson writes, we hold these truths to be self-evident, it's his way of saying any idiot ought to understand this. So not surprising that on MSNBC, the idiots don't understand it, right? Yeah. But, but it was so obvious to them, yeah, we have God-given rights, that's how this works. But because we have people that don't recognize that today, that, that's why it's not working in America. That, that's mm -hmm. why the ship is going the wrong direction or tipping over, however we describe it. it it's a failure to understand what's made America successful, what the foundation was. And, and if we don't relearn that, we can never right the ship. Hmm. Um, you know, it's funny thinking about the book, and I assume there's going to be more of these, right, as you go through the presidents. Um, in, the, in a series, right? Like, see, it feels like it's built yeah. for a series. You built it for sequels. We did. Um, I will say, once you get to telling me stories about like Chester A. Arthur and John Tyler, it's going to be a lot harder to sell books, but <laughs> I'm more interested. I'm like, I got to find out about this because I don't know anything about these guys. <clears throat> but what I was fascinated about reading your book and also thinking about this list over the past couple of weeks, it's just been in everybody's mind. And it's like, Madison just doesn't get the, doesn't get the credit uh, that everyone else does in that period. Like why, everyone talks about Washington and Jefferson and, you know, Adams. And like for whatever reason, like Madison just kind of slips under the radar. Yeah. I mean, this guy was amazing. He was a he was he was a brilliant thinker, and it's it, it, thinking of that's kind of funny because he felt overlooked in many ways as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he tried to be a soldier. He was too small, wasn't strong enough, couldn't keep up, so to speak. But he had a brilliant mind. And the founding fathers talked about, especially you come to the Constitution Convention, they talk about uh, every morning if anybody was prepared, it was Madison. Mm. He had the notes, he had the ideas, suggestions. And it's interesting, it, it, going back historically, he's kind of considered like the father of the Constitution. Yeah. I, I would argue he was one of the five most important people because there's, there's five people you could argue without them, we wouldn't have had the Constitution. Obviously, George Washington mm -hmm. is the president of the convention. It, there's so much disagreement. He's the one that holds it together. We can go through some of those names, but Madison was the guy who had the majority of the ideas. And even though the majority of his ideas ended up being voted down, it created the conversation that yeah. led to the right idea. And every founding father says, this guy was the most prepared. And you go through his life, he was a behind the scenes guy in so many ways. When, when you come to the first Congress, he's a member of the first Congress. So he helps write the constitution. He's a member of the first Congress. He's the one that comes up with the majority of the language for the, for the Bill of Rights. Uh, he came with 20 proposed amendments initially, and then was 12, they sent the states to be ratified. 10 came back. Madison is one of the guys like Washington that when it comes to our system of government is an indispensable person, which really for so many of them that we even highlight in this book, they, they had such incredible contributions that today we have no idea about. 
and rightfully they should be honored for the contributions they gave as opposed to today, nobody knows them, we're trying to tear down their statues, Yeah. right? There's a reason that we used to honor these people and it's because when we knew their stories, we, we knew what price they paid to help America become a nation, to help freedom thrive, all of the good that happened in America, that we were able to help begin promoting the ideas from America of equality, of uh, whether it be equal rights, um, uh, and, and I know this is kind of weird to say because people would argue, wait a second, no, we had had the Civil War and, and it was the 19th or 1900s before men had rights. I, I understand that. But if you look back at the Founding Fathers, those ideas initially came, the abolition movement started with the Founding Fathers, equality started with the Founding Fathers and largely the Northern Founding Fathers. Many Southern ones didn't support that. But those ideas were birthed by some of these guys mm -hmm. that literally went around the world, shaped the entire world. And today, because we don't know their stories, we don't know who to credit for some of these incredible things. Mm. But Madison's an easy guy to overlook. And even though it's a very famous name, if you ask someone, tell me a story about James Madison, they might tell you a fact. Well, he, he wrote the Constitution. Right, right. Well, that's not really a story. And because we don't know the story, we can't connect with them and realize they were people and they struggled, they, they had challenges, they navigated things as well. And the price they paid for America to become the nation they became is quite remarkable. The only ones I would highlight uh, that maybe I don't celebrate as much, mm -hmm. uh, James Monroe, even though he, he is the reason America reunited at, at, at the end of the War of 1812, um, the Northern colonies were promoting secession mm -hmm. because they were more pro-England than they were pro-America in many respects. Mm -hmm. And they were very upset with Madison. They called it Mr. Madison's War. They didn't like it at all. The nation is divided. Monroe gets elected. And he spends the first three years working to reunify the nation. And it became known as the era of good feelings. Uh, the Federalist Party was one of two parties. They closed down because nobody wanted to support them because mm -hmm. everybody comes to support Madison. Uh, excuse me, uh, Monroe. Uh, they come to support Monroe in the era of good feelings. But Monroe is the guy who decides that we should go ahead and, and, and expand slavery in the nation. Like I know the guys before me didn't want to expand slavery, but we're gonna go ahead and do that. He begins taking steps in a very negative direction. And then Jackson is the guy who he just upends the whole ship yeah. Uh, yeah. on so many ways. He, he was a really bad guy as a president. He was an incredible military leader. Even when he was a senator from Tennessee, there were people throwing out the idea, maybe you should be president. And he said, I'd be a terrible president. He said, I'm really good at being rough with men and leading them into battle. I, I'm, right, I'm kind of good at helping kill bad guys, so to speak, but I, I'm, not, I'm not cut out for politics. He knew that about himself. And yet when he got elected, he took his military mentality and he's like, we're gonna crush the enemy. And it wasn't about what's best for America. It was about how can my side win? Mm. Yeah, it's, it, it's, we took a really a wrong turn there. We did. Uh, and it, we've been paying for it forever. I mean, like you mentioned the Monroe stuff, you're, you're expanding slavery. Like you're at a situation where we're still dealing with the outcomes. Every of bit that. of that. It's incredible. Um, the book is fantastic. And it's a book, you know, as Glenn mentioned today on radio, a book you need to have in your library and not only a digital copy, but have a, a paper copy of this because... I mean, I'm, they're going, I, God only knows when they delete it off of Amazon, but get it while you can. The American Story, Building the Republic, you can grab now wherever you get your books. Uh, Tim, thanks so much for coming on the program and do, for doing all this hard work for us. Steve, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Well, the South Carolina primary occurred over the weekend and everyone was on the edge of their seat. What would happen in South Carolina? Always an important, important event. I'm lying. It's been very, very boring. I will say I'm angry at Donald Trump. Um, I'm angry at him because we got no entertainment out of this primary at all. This has been a bore fest, frankly. And like it's part of my job to talk about this stuff. I'm supposed to talk about it for like a whole year. And this is just dull. It's just dull. OK, I'm just being honest. I wish we had a little bit of the fireworks, a little bit of the passion, a little bit of the interesting stuff going on. But honestly, it's been pretty freaking boring. Uh, that kind of continued through South Carolina yesterday. I, you know, you can look at these results a, a bunch of different ways. But Donald Trump got about 60 percent of the vote. Nikki Haley got about 40 percent. And then there were some stragglers. I love those 657 people voted for Chris Christie, despite the fact that he dropped out before New Hampshire. But 657 people are like, you know what? He's just my guy and I'm going for him. Um, so congratulations on that. People say some votes are not wasted. Maybe some of them are, you know. Um, Nikki Haley's home state is unique 
uh, the loss is unique in U.S. politics. Uh, and this is sort of true. She says she's going to go on after this uh, loss. She lost by 20 points. And, like, let's take the negative Nikki Haley side first because it's the most obvious. She's not going to win this primary. We all knew she wasn't going to win this primary. The only chance she ever had to win this primary, and as I said a million times, it's an incredible long shot, but the only path she actually had to make a difference was to win in New Hampshire, win in New Hampshire, and then win in South Carolina because those two states were specifically set up for her to do pretty well. New Hampshire has a voting base that's more moderate, has a lot of independence voting. Uh, she should do pretty well there. She lost by 11 points. She herself said, well, in South Carolina, we're gonna make it closer. It's my home state. This is her home state. She was the governor of the state. She lives in the state. And then she lost by 20 points. Now, it's hard to look at that in a positive light. And what I mean is in a normal context in a normal election you would of course immediately drop out and admit that donald trump was going to be the candidate this is not a normal election she's not running a normal campaign she says she's going to go forward all of that being said she could drop out tomorrow right like ron DeSantis said the same thing about going to south carolina and then he quit you know a week after uh, iowa right like it's just it's one of those things that doesn't mean much when politicians say it but i kind of believe that she will go forward um, and we'll get into maybe that here in, in a second. Uh, so that's the negative view on, on Haley. Uh, the negative view on Trump is basically, well, I don't know, why are 40% of people still not in the Republican primary not voting for, her, for him? It's an interesting question. I mean, I, I think you can look at this two ways, right? Like, if you look at Trump as an incumbent, this is kind of a bad result for Trump, right? Like, if, if, if Joe Biden in South Carolina was going up against, you know, Dean Phillips, and 160 to 40, people, we would be hammering Joe Biden on that. That's terrible. But Donald Trump isn't an incumbent technically, right? He was a, he was a president before, but he's not, a, he's not in office now. It is different. Uh, obviously, you do have people who are independents and Democrats crossing over to vote, which makes that percentage a little bit higher. If you look at just registered Republicans, it's about, it was about 72 to 28. So you have a situation where three quarters of the Republicans voted for Trump. He's not going to have a problem winning this. Um, now, of course, you still have the legal aspects and other things that may get in the way of his presidency. And what she's thinking of now, a lot of people are like, well, why would what's the point? Why would you continue to go uh, on if you're Nikki Haley? Well, eight states are, are in, in the next eight days, about 20 different states are having their primaries. So if you've come this far, the question kind of uh, presents itself of why not? Why not continue for another week, week and a half? Why not see what Super Tuesday brings? I mean, is it costing her anything? She still has money, by all appearances, even though we'll get into that in a minute. But, like, really, there's no downside for Nikki Haley, and I would argue there's not that much downside for Donald Trump either. Just run your campaigns, you know, the way that you can for the next couple of weeks, and, and probably after Super Tuesday, this will all be uh, something that we remember in the past. Maybe Nikki Haley, in her mind, picks up some delegates. I just don't see how she's going to get to five states. I don't see how she's going to be able to get, uh, even make any noise in the convention. But maybe she'll also have some delegates to negotiate with if, if cr crazy things happen. Um, but, uh, you know, you can look at this either way. And, you know, a lot of people on the left are saying, well, this is Trump's big problem in South Carolina. He's, he's not showing that he has strength even in his own party. I don't think that's really the right way to look at it either. Look, Donald Trump is very strong within his party. I think he's doing fine. Uh, he also did fine at CPAC, the straw poll there, 94 to 5 over Nikki Haley. Again, kind of not really uh, all that interesting, frankly. Um, you know, um, they did go uh, VP, which is more interesting, I thought. Vivek Ramaswamy and Christy Nome had uh, first place 15% of the vote. Tulsi Gabbard got 9% of the vote. Elise Stefanik, 8%. Tim Scott and Byron Donald, 7%. By the way, I like Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, you know, she's been on our show before. She has interesting things to say. I'm a little skeptical of having the vice president of the United States with a 77-year-old president being a person who was a Bernie Sanders campaign manager in Hawaii. I, I like, I... Call me crazy, call me wacky. I like Tulsi. There's nothing wrong with Tulsi. She could have a very, in, very interesting uh, person to talk about a role. But as vice president of the United States, one heartbeat away from the presidency, you want someone who was, who was like, you know who I'm going to pick to campaign for? Bernie Sanders? No, thank you. For me. Again, I like Tulsi, but I, this, for me, that's, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, by the way, Koch brothers are going to pull their money from Nikki Haley. 
Um, now, of course, only one of them's alive, so I don't know why we keep calling them the Koch brothers, okay? It's just weird. Well, the other guy's dead, okay? It's only one of them. Okay, can we cut, can we cut with its Koch brother? The Koch brother network is uh, taking their money away from Nikki Haley. Not a huge surprise, but another tough, tough moment for her as this campaign for her winds down. It's just a matter of like, you're looking at it, you're like, okay, it's a one in a hundred shot, but it doesn't cause much damage. I've already burned my bridges with the MAGA people. Why not go for another week and see what happens? That's pretty much where she is at this point. Saturday Night Live happened on Saturday night. Actually, what's that? I guess it starts before, was it 11.30? I don't even remember anymore. Does anyone watch Saturday Night Live on TV anymore? I, I don't know. I, I will say occasionally the sketches make it into my purview. Shane Gillis was on this weekend. And actually, I was kind of interested in this uh, storyline. If you remember, Shane Gillis was supposed to be like a low-tier cast member of Saturday Night Live in like, what, 2020? He was getting higher, 2021 in that range. Um, and he, you know, again, wasn't well known at all. It was going to be like one of those guys at the end of the bench, basically. And they brought him on and like immediately people went back and like listened to old podcasts of his and found tweets of his that had said bad things. And he was naughty. And so he had to be fired immediately before he even did anything. Really an incredible story. He decided to go, go and put out his own special. He pays for it himself, does a special. It releases it on YouTube, gets 24 million views. Uh, he winds up starting up his own thing, does a bunch of sketches, builds his own stuff on the Internet, and becomes so popular that Saturday Night Live invites him back just three years later, not to be a cast member, but to be the host of the show, which is I mean, it's an incredible arc. Um, he did pretty well, I thought. He, there was a couple sketches I thought were really funny um, that they really did well, the, some of the recorded stuff. The, his monologue was not the best thing I've seen him do. He's, uh, he's a very funny guy. Uh, but, you know, it was, his style's a little weird for that format, I felt like, you know, in a stand-up format where you're, I don't know, it's a lot of, you know, questioning himself and self-deprecating. And, like, if you don't know him, you might not get some of it. Uh, but overall, I think he did a pretty good job. And it was a nice thing to see, you know, cancel culture just take one on the nose, right? Like, just backhanded across the face. The idea that of cancel culture, you just cancel people and they go away forever. That was what was supposed to happen to Shane Gillis. Instead, he wound up turning it into uh, something pretty great and a career that uh, continues to thrive. So congratulations to Shane Gillis. I would recommend uh, going back and checking out some of the sketches uh, from this week's Saturday Night Live. And I do not say that often. You know, we haven't spent enough time laughing about the Israel-Hamas situation, have we? <laughs> Uh, no, this is going to go over well. Uh, we've got Israel versus Hamas, a special sportscaster's uh, outing. It's available only on YouTube right now, youtube.com slash Studios America. I believe it's also available in your Blaze TV accounts, so you can check it out there if you happen to be a subscriber already. BlazeTV.com slash Stu. Promo code is Stu if you want to do it that way, or it's right on YouTube, youtube.com slash Stu Does America. We also have Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered, 7 p.m. Eastern. It's a brand new show on Blaze TV, of course, on YouTube and podcasts as well. I was lucky enough to be on the program today along with my friend Pat, Pat Gray. Had a great conversation, as we always do with Sarah. Great show. Check it out. 7 p.m. Eastern Blaze TV. Sarah Gonzalez, Unfiltered. <laughs>